something. Bingo! <laughs> <laughs> it's Monday, 12 o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel. Happy to be here on Think Tech. And we have Mina, Marco, and me on Monday. Uh, that's our show. And a co-host here in the studio uh, is Mina Morita. And the co-host uh, who joins us um, by Skype audio from, um, from what? Kona? Kona? Hilo. Um, is is uh, Marco Mangelsdorf for Provision Solar? We're all together, and we have Shelley Kimura, and we have Commissioner Lorena Kiba. This is a big show. That's why we're giving it 45 minutes today. Exciting, all right? Um, so, and we're calling it Women in Power. Yay! It's a double entendre, <laughs> you know. Like we're going to explore time. that. Yes. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Marco now, and he's going to introduce our three guests. Well, I want to tell you all sincerely how appreciative I am and thankful for being able to get the, uh, the five of us together and I'm so so thrilled to have uh, three of my uh, my good uh, friends uh, four of my good friends in energy there to be able to uh, to sit down before you so thank you all so much for for joining Jay and I and Mina today and uh, it is just really special I think to be able to get uh, such uh, uh, illustrious lineup uh, of uh, women in power in our in our little state here and uh, i've really looked forward to this show over the past weeks and uh, i think it's going to be fun 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 uh, shelly kimura from uh, hawaii electric light company who i'm very pleased to have join us shelly is the vice president of business and strategic planning uh, corporate development and renewable acquisition there's uh, that wouldn't be hawaii electric and, light company that would be hawaiian electric, electric company. let's talk <laughs> about the parent here <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah okay. Hawaiian Electric Company, and then we have our co-host and uh, dear friend Mina Marita, who has uh, a long <laughs> history of being involved in the energy field. Uh, first as a uh, representative from the 14th District on Kauai, uh, former chair of the House Environment, uh, Energy and Environment Committee, and then also uh, chair of the Public Utilities Commission under Neil Abercrombie, and then finally our friend Lorena Kiba, who is uh, an actual serving member of the current uh, commission with fellow commissioners Randy Iwase and, and Tom Gorak. So uh, uh, truly an all-star lineup today, and I'm, I'm so pleased to be part of it. Great. Marco, we're going to take one second break to make sure everything's connected, and we're going to come right back, okay? We're back. We're live. We have Mina Morita, uh, a, a co-host of this program, Mina, Marie, Mina, Mina, Marco, and me. And we have uh, Marco, of course, the other co-host in Hilo and ProVision Solar. We have Shelly Kimura uh, from Hawaiian Electric. She's Vice President of Planning and Development. And we have Commissioner Lorraine Akiba from the Public Utilities Commission. Wow, what an all-star cast. So, Marco, will you start the questions now? I guess my first question is kind of a general one uh, to each of you is, uh, what led you to decide to get involved in the energy field? You've, you've kind of, each of you have kind of taken somewhat different directions, and uh, I'd just like to give you a chance to, to address that question and explain how, what kind of uh, path you took in terms of getting involved in what has been predominantly, for a long, long time, a male-dominated field. So what, what led you to, to take this path? Yeah, what, what, he, what he wants to know is what... What fantastic event happened, what epiphany happened, Mina, in your life that you should get involved in energy? What happened that day? Oh, simple. Um, when I got reelected in my second term, um, I wanted, I actually wanted to be chair of water and land use. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I was told... That's something that having to do with the environment, yeah. And I was told no, because you know, I've taken some controversial stands, and nobody wanted um, energy and environmental protection. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up with energy and environmental protection. And the first year I was a chair, I mainly worked on environmental issues. And it was a down economy at that time, and all the programs were getting mm -hmm. cut. And so I didn't feel productive at all. And during the interim, I was trying to form a form an agenda and you know with oil prices up economy down you know if I wanted to make a difference I had to fix the economy and the way to fix the economy was to address energy issues so 
so that's how I got it started. all connects up yeah. and I mean I, I don't want to go too far on this point but this was 20 years plus ago yes and that was in 98 um, 98 okay yep. well that's not not quite not, 20 years. Not, almost <laughs> <laughs> what about you Shelley so you know my path is kind of a windy path um, I didn't set out to be an energy like like Mina um, but it it ended up being that way um, I think early on I mean I've always been very focused on environment and you know growing up in Hawaii and when I went to college very much focused on stewardship of our land and our environment wow. that kind of angle um, but I ended up going into accounting and getting my CPA license and going it's a great to, combination yeah, it's a unlikely combination, combination. <laughs> yeah, I, I was gonna go back and get my law degree but you know <laughs> life happens and I didn't do that um, and one thing led to another and I ended up at Kamehameha schools working at Kamehameha schools full-time um, as a consultant focused on land issues and endowment issues and then the opportunity came to um, go to Hawaiian Electric or uh, HEI the parent company mm -hmm. and um, you know as a woman I had my first child second one was on the way and so it was more of a work-life balance decision at that time to get out of consulting and do what I perceived to have more work-life balance which it didn't <laughs> <laughs> but um, so it took me down that path and then um, Hawaiian Electric Company entered into the clean energy agreement um, in 2008 and that was something that I had a lot of passion for so we heard the sound of roar and, yeah. and ch world changing November, I think it was 2008. Yeah. October, yeah. October, and so okay. um, that was something that I felt very passionate about and wanted to get behind, and that's kind of kept me there since then. Did you have any trepidation about uh, you know, being a woman going into energy at that time? You know, I didn't. Um, it never really phased me that way. Uh, so. To, that wasn't part of my, my mindset as I went forward. Great. <laughs> Lorena Kiba, you started out as a lawyer. Yes, I did. And how, how, did, how did the path wind for you? Well, I think the path came from being a lawyer. I, I, I know that as, as, um, as a member of the community, I've always been engaged in, and, um, and very much passionate about things to do with the environment, with sustainability, with climate change and issues. And in my law practice, I, I headed the environmental practice groups for both of the law firms where I was a partner at. But really, it comes from um, being a, um, a young person here in Hawaii growing up, and my parents influenced those values of, of taking care of not just um, you know, the, the land, but also the creatures and species and being sustainable and balanced. It's probably from that Buddhist value of you're just part of a, of a universe and, and yeah. the concepts that Shelley talked about, stewardship. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what brought me into energy was really the opportunity actually to work with, with you know, with the leadership uh, at the time under Governor Abercrombie and, and Mina was chair at that time at a very dynamic time and so my passionate interest in the environment and the you know the energy nexus with the environmental issues is, is so critical so I think um, being able to be a servant leader uh, and to continue to um, stay true to, to those values is, is why I ended up here in the energy uh, space where it is very important right now a lot of critical issues so um, it, it really does uh, take women to make a difference. Yeah. So you were practicing in energy law, environment and energy law. By the way, that's the common denominator, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Environmental mm -hmm. stewardship. That's what I get from all three of you, which is really something. It's different than, you know, say in the past when a guy would go to school, a guy, notice I said guy, a guy would go to school and study engineering and right. that got him right. into energy. This is different, yeah. So, <clears throat> so you were practicing energy law and then one day, Somebody called you and said, Lorraine, <laughs> how would you like to be a PUC commissioner? Mm -hmm. Did you snap that up? <laughs> <laughs> I have to think about that. Like, what does that involve? But I think what, what, uh, what was, uh, you know, because I did not regularly appear in front of the Public Utility Commission. Actually, my energy practice was in arbitration mediation and in the, in the courtroom context being a, a, a litigator in that, in that area. So, um, and maybe that was good because I didn't appear before the Public mm -hmm. Utility Commission, so there was no uh, uh, potential bias or, or agenda mm -hmm. or having uh, any um, preset notion of, of, of what to do. I think just taking on the duties uh, and my responsibilities and, and living up to um, what the charge of the job is, is to decide things in the public interest, uh, uh, to also 
uh, not just regulate utilities, but also to be part and parcel of the policy making uh, functions that fall to the commission. Um, it's a very important agency, uh, quasi judicial as well as policy making, and I, you know that's probably why I think the the women that have come into the energy industry are so important because a lot of policy needs to be made now at this very critical time. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. This is the policy time. Before it was the engineering time. This is the policy time. But I would imagine that when you came into the PUC, it was like an immersion course <laughs> in, in, in technology, no? Yes, it, it was. Uh, you know, definitely hit the ground running. But I was used to that. You know, I was a complex commercial litigation attorney. So you got to learn fast and, you know, <laughs> take absorb like a sponge from uh, knowledgeable folks that I served on the commission with, like Mina and, and uh, you know, and uh, Mike Champley. And, uh, you know, and then also immerse myself in, in the opportunities and, and getting involved with the National Association of Regulatory Utility commissioners to, um, to have a perspective beyond just our island grids and to see what's uh, happening on the mainland with sister states that are, are doing um, some similar things that we can share best practices and also uh, let them know what we're doing that's wonderful here. Yeah, yeah, because we have something to give, don't we? We do. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next question. Wow, I'm really enjoying this. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wait a minute. That was my question, and I, and I think we reversed it. Marco, why don't you take the next question? <laughs> So you've all brought various kind of uh, taken various different paths to where you are now from the utility side for Shelley regulatory for both MENA and, and the Lorraine legislative for MENA. So this question is, how do you find it's been different for you as a woman to participate in the energy field compared to men? And kind of a similar question follow on to that is what particular challenges as a woman have you encountered in the energy field? <laughs> <laughs> Lorraine, why don't we start with you? Okay. Well, I think, you know, I'm, I've always been in a field where there's uh, uh, it previously a men dominated, I would say probably, you know, the legal profession and being a, a partner at a major law firm. I mean, a, in years past, you probably wouldn't see a woman partner as a, as a legal partner. You were so, breaking barriers all over town. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of what women leaders do, Jay. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. <laughs> but I think what's important is that... Um, while there are there is a need to uh, build off the past and the foundation and utilities especially in the, in the energy indus industry area there are certain obligations for reliability safety and resiliency but there's also a need to to break out of the box to look at innovation and to embrace innovation and technology which is i think an ability that women have so i i believe that um having more women in the energy space allows for that creative thinking and um Hopefully, the egos don't get in the way that people can be open-minded, more flexibility, mm -hmm. more ability to be open to new ideas, and to also facilitate dialogue. I think women have, by virtue of uh, the societal values that have been put on us, we're able to facilitate, we're able to um, mediate, we are able to listen, um, and, and those are important skills that are needed in this energy landscape now, especially if we want to move forward and face and address the challenges. Yeah, isn't that true? That's all true, actually. So, Shelley, um, you know, you got into this. Uh, how did you, in, in, a, in a company that has been dominated by male engineers, may I say that, for a long time, a hundred years, uh, how, did, how did that feel? And uh, how did you feel you fit? And how did you feel uh, the men were seeing you? And how did you see the men? Well, I think Hawaiian Electric might be unique in that Connie Lau is our CEO. Ah, so true. We have a, you know, Lest a we forget. Yeah. She's at the table, at but the, uh, sort of. <laughs> yeah. And um, when you look at Hawaiian Electric Company itself, there's a large number of executive women in the ranks. And so I didn't really feel out of place. Um, I don't know if it's more of being a woman or the fact that I didn't have an engineering background that was more the, of the challenge. And being able to leverage both the men and the women with the engineering background on my teams to be able to put that together with the strategic and the financial uh, concepts and you know how do we leverage innovation to be able to move forward and, and really lead the nation as we try and reach these um, nation leading RPS schools that we have. And when you add the environmental stewardship to the you know say the formula the mix of elements that existed you know before mm -hmm. Uh, I think women do fit, fit very well in that, as Lorraine pointed out. Yeah, they actually have studies about when women <laughs> succeed, and women succeed more when they're fighting for a cause that's not their 
their for themselves mm -hmm. um, not promoting themselves but fighting for other people or fighting for a mission and so I think that's probably okay. why mm -hmm. women will do well when it comes to clean energy I actually went to a national conference um, that was focused on clean energy and women and this was one of the things that they brought up which I thought was very interesting and also the fact that it's going to take lots of parties working together building on what Lorraine was saying to make this happen and um, because of the way that we're brought up as women you know part of it is is genetic part of it is just the way we're brought up is to cl collaborate and um, find that common ground and be able to move things forward yeah mm -hmm. great and it's it's increasing isn't it i mean would you say that as a proportion there are more women uh, in energy or at least in hawaiian electric in utility energy than there were say when you joined yeah i would say that that's true yeah. Lots of interest as well because of what Hawaii is trying to do. Yeah, right. So it helps us recruit. We have much on our plate. Yeah. yeah. Mina Marita, gee, I, I'm trying to remember if there was a woman on the PUC before you joined. Or for that matter, mm -hmm. whether, yes, there was? There several. Um, it, you know, their names just escaped me, but there were several. Yeah. I mean, I think at least three yeah. be, before me. Yeah. So how is it different for a woman? Uh, in energy, on the PUC, in the legislature, doing energy. Um, let me tell you about a story in the legislature when I first started working on bills. And I think this was kind of the primary difference between um, a male perspective and a female perspective. When you start off with bills, people usually have, think what they want at the end in the bill at the very beginning. And so usually, the guys would take that particular bill all the way to the end and at the last minute try to fix it. And I, in many women in the legislature improve the bills as they go along to come to a final end product. You're probably going to say that's a better, better way to do it. I, personally, yes. Okay. I, I think well. so. But what caught me off guard in the beginning was at the end I had nothing to negotiate out <laughs> and the guys had lots to negotiate you know negotiate and and so it was you know it was a very interesting it, analysis yeah so um, so I think just how we process is yeah. very different and you know so how to accommodate so those do we need both styles or will I one, you, will I one think, uh, you know, prevail? <laughs> I, I think you need both styles. Um, and, but just, there has to be a real good understanding of how people come to decisions, how people make decisions, how people perceive a problem. And I think, um, you know, before it used to be really easy because we were dealing with a lot of linear problems, you know. You're trying to find one solution uh, for the problem, but now, you know, we're dealing with really complex systems. We're, we're, we're dealing with environmental, social, and economic problems, and engineering problems. And, and so, you know, the, the, the problem solving is more complex. It takes uh, better understanding, uh, more education, and better collaboration amongst all the stakeholder groups. And that's going to continue, for yes. sure. And, and I think women are just a little bit more patient in, in trying to achieve the best results to, to uh, these problems. Okay, now we have a more interesting, even more, even more interesting question. I, I'll let Marco put it to you. Uh, regarding the challenges or? No, whether it's <clears throat> easier working with other women than working with men. Maybe we've touched on that already, but. I'm curious well, to see. You're going to pose the question yourself, Jay. Why don't you? Why okay. You well, <laughs> so <clears throat> now there are, as we know, there are more women coming into the field, mm -hmm. and that probably is going to continue because of the the skill sets, the approach, the cultural, you know, way of looking at things, all those things. Um, so, is it easier to work with women who take their approach, or to, with men? What is your experience? Of? We're really drilling down now. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me jump in here. I, I think it is actually uh, now a, a, a good thing to have more women in there, and I can say that from my personal experience of dealing with the, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. A lot of the commissioners coming in 
um, into chair positions and into leadership positions in the committees for NARU are women, and they leave the dialogue. And, and I, I think it's a focus on team building. Uh, and even though uh, many of, of the of women have the same concerns, it's uh, a different way of problem solving. And uh, this, uh, definitely allowing a, a comfort zone for people to be able to express their opinions and that reasonable people can differ, as opposed to it being, um, you know, f drawing a line in the sand and being combat combative. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Sh Shelley kind of alluded to it, you know, um, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. We do have different skill sets, and that's you heard it here on ThinkTech. A dynamic society. We aren't all the same, um, but you know, I mean, there are, there are strong women. I mean, it's not a matter of being, you know, weak or, or strong or or passive. I think it's just a different way of approaching yeah. and team building. And I think women are very much focused on um, outcomes, getting the job done improving the process, making sure that everybody feels they are involved in that process. Because so at the end of the day, even if you didn't get what you thought to be the actual solution, you feel that you've been um, given the due process, you've been involved in mm -hmm. the dialogue, so that when people have to make a decision and, and the consensus or, or someone individually makes a decision, there is more buy-in. So I think women are more focused on that. So I find it's actually, it's refreshing sometimes because we're not, we're, we don't have to do all that ego, you know, kind of testosterone thing on the table, you know, <laughs> just, just get to it, you know. And if we only have like 45 minutes for a meeting, people know it's 45 minutes for a meeting, you know, let's get to it. Let's focus on getting right, the job done. Right, right. A lot of these women have things to do. They have children to take care of, <laughs> husbands to take care of, <laughs> other things to, to do, <laughs> right. You know, they're multitasking in, in their other parts of their lives. So, you know, they get it done. Well, it strikes me, you know, at this point in time, we all talk about collaboration all day long. Mm -hmm. And collaboration has got to be one of the most important things in m making energy happen, reaching our goals, um, because it brings people together, it builds teams and all that. What would you add to that, Shelley? Uh, well, you know, I have a, an experience with my daughter. She um, joined a Lego robotics team. And that team had been together for three or four years, all boys from her, her kindergarten class. They had moved up. And at one point, maybe fourth grade, they decided they wanted to add two girls to add some diversity to the group and help balance them out. And so they added two girls, my daughter and one other girl. And the other parents who had been on the team for a while said how much the group improved with the addition of the girls. And I think that that's just um, the dynamics of a team, to have diversity on a team makes a team better mm -hmm. because the more perspectives you have, the better answer you're going to come up with. So it's not just about men and women, but it's just uh, different experiences, expertise, gender, you know, may play into it as well and coming up with the ideas and the answers and being able to move something forward is all important. But on the team, the women have to be, have to be able to express themselves. Absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the if modern you woman if does you don't not have your voice, then you're not going to be heard, right? So yeah. it's important to do that, and and I think it's important um, for us to teach our girls and our, our women coming up in the ranks to trust in their own authentic leadership style, because our leadership style is not necessarily going to be the same as a man's leadership style, but it's still effective, and not look at what a woman is as a limitation, but as a strength, and I think that. We have to embed that in our in our women coming up the ranks. I love this show. It's a great show. <laughs> this is a very important show. And so much so that we're going to take a short break now. <laughs> we'll come right back, and then we'll we go to more questions that we have, and feel even better and better about it. <laughs> Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. We hope you join us every Wednesday at noon right here at Think Tech Hawaii as well as on OC16. Our show covers a range of important topics regarding education, our educational system, where we are, where we're going, where we need to go, and some of the important people that are working on that, from state legislators uh, to department heads uh, to teachers and students. We bring in everyone we possibly can to have a comprehensive conversation about the educational system here in Hawaii. So we hope you join us again every Wednesday at noon here on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. Aloha kako. I'm Marcia Joyner inviting you to navigate the journey with us. We are here every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. and we really want you to be with us where we look at the options and choices of end-of-life care. 
Aloha. We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on Mino, Marco, Marco Mina, and me. Uh, Women in Power, a very special show um, with uh, Mina Morita, uh, Shelly Kimura, and Lorraine Akiba, current uh, commissioner of the PUC. And uh, Marco, it's your turn. So why don't you ask the next question that we have in store for our guests? So as, as women in power here in Hawaii, do you find that there is much of a difference working in the energy field here in our Aloha state compared to what you know or women that you know working in the energy field on the mainland? Well, you know, when I do travel to the mainland and also talk with um, colleagues on the mainland and, and meet with the utility um, uh, representatives um, from the mainland, I, I, see, I see the same diversity. Uh, and uh, many of these come from traditional utilities that were previously dominated um, by male executives, male engineers, but the same trends that are, I mean, Hawaiian Electric is not unique in terms of the issues that, that uh, we face here in Hawaii. And also uh, the, the, the new wave and next generation of women engineers and men, uh, quite frankly, that are coming in uh, open to um, uh, the different things that are happening in the energy space. So I don't see it as necessarily being different. I think what is a positive thing is that as more women have come into the energy space, they're somebody's daughter, they're somebody's sister, they're somebody's mother. Sure. You know, so a men um, in, in positions of responsibility and, and power are, are, are looking at, um, at some of these uh, folks um, as they would their own, uh, you know, family members. And so it, it is more of a, again, I think an awareness that, that exists. And especially because some of these issues do touch on policy and many of the, uh, the women are involved in those areas, I think there's been um, quite, uh, you know, a good, a good synthesis of, of uh, ideas from both um, men and women. Mm -hmm. I don't see it as, as, as an adversarial thing, at mm -hmm. least not in the, the communities and with the... Uh, utilities and regulators I've had contact with. Mm. Shelley, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we have learned over the past couple of years that not all utility companies are the same, uh, and that the cultures in one company may be, the culture in one company may be different, particularly when you're dealing with a culture in a utility company in Hawaii versus a culture in a utility company on the mainland. Um, but I'm, I'm just, want, you know, and we, we've established that uh, one of the base, baselines at least in Hawaii, is the notion of environmental stewardship. Not all the companies on the mainland may feel the same way about it. So in your travels, you know, how do you feel a woman's career would be different in a utility company on the mainland? Um, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I've, I've interacted with a lot of other um, utilities. I, uh, it, part of my career, I was doing investor relations, so I traveled a lot, meeting with a lot of um, the investor community and it was mostly male in the utility and energy industry um, I think that and this is just um, my perception but on the mainland the the culture is a lot more aggressive just overall regardless if you're a female or, or a male and so I think that women's style in general is not as aggressive in Hawaii it's not as much and it's more inclusive. So perhaps it's a little easier for women to um, be accepted and um, integrate into the business world in Hawaii than on the mainland. And it's a little bit more of a fight or a, a battle <laughs> um, for, for some of my colleagues that I've, I've oh, spoken interesting, to. Interesting, yeah. interesting, interesting observation, yeah. Mina, how about you? I mean, how, how do you feel it works? You, you do a lot of uh, travel these days and you go to conferences hither and yon. What's the difference between a woman in energy, such as your own career, versus a woman in energy on the mainland or in another country for that matter? Well, first of all, I could just have to correct the record. Since I'm retired, most of my travel has been pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> We're jealous. Mom, yay. Yay. <laughs> but, but I think, you know, um, Talking about leadership in general, you know, whether you're a man or a, lead, uh, or a woman, you know, what you really want in a leader is a person that can bring, bring out the best qualities of, um, of their employees or individuals, um, regardless of gender. So I think that, that's the most important thing, you know, how, how, how do we get beyond the gender line? 
um, but really, you know, what kind of leaders um, are out there that can bring in the best qualities of a person um, into the workplace? In terms of supervising, you know, the, the team, mm -hmm. do women have an advantage over men or do men have an advantage over women? Well, I think, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, hopefully we're getting to a point where both will be nurtured. Okay, okay. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's what I would like to see. Um, uh, but, you know, again, I, I think, you know, it's always been um, the primary responsibility of a woman to, you know, be the nurturer of whether it's her household or within the workplace many times. And um, so... Nurturing you know, builds loyalty, doesn't it? Trust, I think. Trust. Trust, is yeah. 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 trust yeah. transparency, credibility, respect, mm -hmm. um, fairness. Mm -hmm. I think those are the, and those are the leadership qualities that, uh, if, whether you're a man or a woman, you should exemplify. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, people aren't able to do that, and, and therefore they're not as effective in, in being a leader, but that's important. And I think a new, uh, one more attribute that is important in the energy um, area, especially for utilities, uh, when we talk about the utility of the future, is the courage to be visionary. And that, that is, an, uh, you know, a trait that hopefully we're cultivating in both men and women and in the next generation of energy leaders because it, it is a very challenging time and you know I think uh, you know to, to the credit of many women in the profession they've had to face barriers they've had to break through they've had to you know do 200 percent when maybe a colleague a male colleague only had to do 100 percent but I think that's the kind of um, grit the kind of courage the kind of tenacity uh, that a lot of women who do want to contribute and do want to um, excel uh, bring bring to the workplace. Yeah. So uh, you know, I, I I've seen it and I've observed it. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's a positive thing. Yeah. Inherent in that is the yeah. willingness to take risks, yeah. courage. You courage. mentioned. Yeah. Well, I, I think you know the the best leaders I've seen have been uh, good coaches. You know, they 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 know when to rebuild, you know, they understand what it takes to lay the foundation and, um, you know, when everything is going right, you know, they know how to step back and, and just encourage. So, um, yeah, regardless whether it's a male or female, I mean, that's... I, th I think we important. see some extraordinary women leaders of, of, that, of that nature in uh, Hawaiian Electric, actually. Connie Lau is a good example, uh, so is Lynn uh, Unimori. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lynn, are you listening? Yeah. <laughs> Connie? <laughs> yeah. What would you add to that, Shelley? Well, I mean, we have a lot of women leaders in our company. We have Sharon Suzuki and Darcy mm -hmm. Endo Omoto, and um, we had um, at one point Pat um, Wong. And so, you know, we have a lot of women in, in those leadership positions, uh, which I think helps both our, our executive team, but also our workforce to um, cascade that diversity and appreciation for that diversity throughout the organization. Marco, uh, it's time to ask the compensation question. Are you ready to do that? You want me to do it? Well, start it off anyway. <laughs> this, is a, this is an interesting question, I think. So this is the, the, for the three of you, uh, Lorraine, Shelley and uh, Mina, do you believe that the compensation, the monetary compensation, is comparable uh, for women as it is compared to men here in Hawaii? And how does it compare, as far as you know, with, let's say, compensation on the mainland? Well, the is there a disparity? I don't, I don't Have you ever I'm noticed a disparity, seen a disparity? I, I know that in studies mm -hmm. that women typically get paid less. And it's interesting because they've they've shown that women won't ask. And that's part of the issue, that men will actually go and ask for the raise or ask for something more when they're negotiating in a new job. And women won't necessarily do that. And when you don't do that, and that just compounds year after year as you're getting your whatever percent increase, it becomes a huge difference at the end. So, uh, you know, it's hard for me to say whether it's an institutional issue or just a what someone's willing to negotiate and ask for mm -hmm. issue um, mm -hmm. and that supervisors are shown to focus on those that are being vocal about it and not so much on those that are, are silent. 
So I think that's a, just a lesson for myself and for all of us. As yeah. We look at yeah, you're right. Issues. It's yeah. a matter of speaking up. Yeah. We, we, I think we fare a little better in Hawaii than the rest of the nation. I, I think the average for the rest of the nation for equal pay for equal right. work is about 75 cents to a dollar. Yeah. And in Hawaii, I think it's around 82 cents to a dollar. Um, you know, with um, having uh, unions is helpful mm -hmm. in, in creating more equality for pay. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there still is this disparity. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, at, at all levels, uh, you know, there is pay disparity. I think that's what is a big issue in the last election um, nationally. Mm -hmm. Uh, but oh, it's also, all resolved now. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's going to get much better. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, um, but I think, in the, you know, at, at, even at the corporate level, um, uh, in terms of the glass ceiling, we talk about that. I mean, there are a few examples, I mean, you know, of, of corporate uh, women who have risen to the top, and, 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 you know, they continue to set the example. I mean, locally, Connie, and then, you know, I can think for Con Ed, um, Anna Famagione. Mm -hmm. I mean, out there, really, quite a visionary. and and a very articulate and, and a dynamic leader, but those are far and few between. So we need to do more, I think, um, as a society, as a state, to make sure that women are uh, compensated fairly and that it becomes just an issue, as, as Mina said, who is the most effective leader. Uh, maybe I come from a background, you know, a law firm where, you know, it's, uh, you, you basically are, you have to be aggressive about your compensation when it comes time to giving up, you know, the partnership proceeds. So I'm used to that. <laughs> but, you know, it, most people aren't, and especially in Hawaii where we're taught to be uh, consensus building, to be, you know, humble. Uh, yeah, again, uh, those kinds of traits aren't always um, encouraged. But um, it is, what, again, a matter of courage. You speak up if you don't think that somebody's doing something correctly or right yeah, by you yeah. as an employee, then you should speak up. Yeah, but it's, it's, it takes two hands, yeah. though. I mean, the people yeah. who run the show, whether they be men or women, um, should not allow the disparity. Right. And they should do, you know, they should come it's an to you and say, responsibility. <clears throat> you know, I noticed, Shelley, that you didn't ask for as much money as you might have last time around. Uh, so I'm telling you, we're going to give you a raise because we think no matter what you ask for, you're worth X, X which is the same thing we would pay a man. Right. I mean, if the guy on top or the woman on top takes that point of view, then you don't have to be too aggressive because, you know, they kind of do it for you. <laughs> right, right. And, and I was speaking generally, I mean, at Hawaiian Electric, we do something that we call calibration, that we look across all areas and make sure that um, we're, we're looking at everything uh, in an equal manner. Mm -hmm. Well, we're at the last part of our show now. We're at the part where we ask you to look into camera number one okay Which and uh, oh that's ahead. number one over there right <laughs> straight ahead of you All right. okay oh, <clears throat> and, uh, and address the audience whoever they may be they may be men in energy women in energy everybody in energy they may be from your constituencies or any constituency they may be high school kids uh, thinking about what to do with their lives in, in the environment, in the stewardship, and in, in energy. So, uh, Marco, why don't you frame the question that you would like to see our three guests, uh, you know, address in, in talking to the public. Okay, so the question is, so at this point in your, your careers and at this point in your path in the energy field, what candid, thoughtful advice would you give to women in the energy field coming up behind you? And do you think it's easier to be accepted and taken seriously now compared to a handful of years ago? But I guess really uh, I'd be very interested to hearing what kind of advice you would give to those coming up the ladder behind you. Nina, why don't you start? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I'll start with, you know, I, I have four granddaughters, you know, um, 11, 9, nine and three and I, I would say the same to them that they can do anything that they want um, uh, you know the future is theirs to hold and and there's no limits and you know the jobs that we have available now um, you know they're not limited by gender and so you know in order to get ahead get a good education you know uh, be truthful, um, work hard, and you know the sky's the limit. And 
ask for help. A lot of people don't ask for help. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and especially for women um, entering the energy uh, field right now in Hawaii, we have a WIRE, Women mm -hmm. in Renewable Energy, mm -hmm. which, is a, which is a great <laughs> right. support group. You know, and, and, support um, groups are important. Mentors are important. Offering that and, and um, you know, just the ability to socialize with other women in the, in the industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Shelly? Um, let's see. So I have two daughters. And so, <laughs> you know, whenever um, I'm in a situation where I'm trying to make choices, you know, I do think of my daughters and my children. I have two daughters and one son. And um, there's always those choices you're trying to make and you're always pulled career, family, you know, husband, children, whatever it is. And um, it's, it's not easy, and um, everybody makes their individual choices, and you don't have to follow the path of any other one individual. Everybody creates their, their own path and figure out, figures out what works for them. And um, again, it's always just being true to yourself and what you believe in and what you value. And I think that makes a stronger person and a stronger leader so you are able to be effect effective and whatever your passion is and whatever career that you end up choosing to go into. And as far as energy for anyone that's considering, any you know female or male considering going into energy is such an exciting field right now mm -hmm. and one in which you can truly make a difference um, in society and the world. So I, I encourage folks to do that if they have an interest. It's going to become more and more exciting as we go forward too. Lorraine, you're last. You, okay. You're the, you're the anchor man on All this. All right. Well, I, anchor I wanna, lady. I want to <laughs> echo everything that um, but both Mina and Shelley say because it's true, uh, you know, in terms of uh, mentors, a support group, which we have now. And I think about my own mentor, which was my mom, you know, and she was a very strong, um, and, you know, talking about glass, you know, breaking the glass ceiling back in her day being a, a you know, a, a, a a Japanese American physician at, at her time was, you know, there was only a few and she had to deal with a lot of issues and challenges. So I take um, a lot of inspiration from her and it is true that you have to keep true to yourself, be strong, um, and get the skill sets as Mina pointed out so that you can effectively uh, demonstrate that you have the skills. And I would, I would say that, um, that it is important to, to um, be true to your own compass um, and to never doubt yourself. I would like to uh, uh, encourage everybody to see a movie I just saw actually this weekend called The Eagle Huntress. And mm -hmm. it's a, a, a documentary about a young woman, 13 years old in Mongolia and Kazakhstan. Uh, a part of a, a, she's the first female eagle hunter in her tribe. I've heard of this. And her father was very supportive, her grandfather was very supportive, but the rest of the elders thought that this was not something that a woman should do. She was phenomenal, she's a strong woman, smart trained, did all the skill sets to become the most phenomenal eagle huntress, and she won the competition, and she also successfully hunted uh, on her first hunt with her father. So you have to see the movie because it's an empowering movie about girls can be empowered, women can be empowered. There are no limits. You, you choose what you want to do, and you live true to your own compass and set that course. Uh, you know, just like the Polynesian voyagers, you keep true to your star, <laughs> and, you, and you find that course even uh, in, um, in choppy and, and, and stormy waters. Women in Power, Lorraine Akiba, uh, Shelly Kimura, Mina Morita, and I'm going to leave it to you, Marco, to close this. You have the closing remarks, so say farewell. I think it's been a fantastic show, Jay and Lorraine, Shelly and Mina. Thank you so very much for making time out of your day today, and I do hope this is something that we can do on a, uh, at least semi-regular basis in, in the months and year to come, because I think there's still so much more that we can talk about uh, and i think it's just been uh, a superb way to spend the uh, past 45 46 minutes so thank you all again and thank you jay for for being the 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 host and questioner there with me uh you rock the world as you always shall so uh, thank you again so much <laughs> thank you marco thank, thank you ladies thank you. it's been a great thank discussion you. aloha and happy christmas it. thank you thank you <laughs> happy Halloween.